Good morning. So if you've watched this channel for a long enough time, ooh, that is, this is skew as hell. Uh, so good morning. If you watch this channel long enough, you'll know that I am a big thinker and I like to think about the future and space technology and all the cool things that I'm gonna see invented in my lifetime. To wit, today's video is a collection of five wild future technology ideas that I've had recently that using current physics, I do think are gonna be able to be accomplished or at least we could have the potential to invent some of these technologies in the next couple of years to solve some of our problems. Um, and I watched a lecture the other day from Robert Zubrin, he talks about colonizing Mars a lot, um, talking about what is the most important thing in the world today from the perspective of humans in a hundred years time or two hundred years time. What is the most important thing happening today uh, from their perspective? Because in 1492, I think it was, maybe it was 1692, I'll put the date, the correct date there, what was happening in the world? There was lots of politicians uh, talking their spiel, there was people dying, there were people living, there was a uh, stock market collapse, not stock market, but like economies crashing on that. But what do we remember from this year here? It's that Columbus discovered America then, or the Bahamas, or whatever he did. And so right now as well, what are the things that are happening in the world that are gonna be forgotten in 100 years time? And what are the things that are going to be remembered in 100 or 200 years time? And Robert Zubrin was arguing that space technology and uh, technical stuff, technology being invented now, will be what we will, will be remembered in a couple of centuries time. And so I wanted to take today's video to talk about some of the ideas that I've had for some future technologies um, and let's start off with Jurassic Park. Seriously, Jurassic Park. So, um, uh, in the future, um, we might be able to have the technology or the electricity uh, generation capacity necessary to build an O'Neill cylinder. Now, if you're not familiar with the concept, an O'Neill cylinder is a floating, rotating space habitat that orbits around a star and uses solar power to generate all of the electricity. And it's basically a way to build an orbital rotating habitat for humans or whatever else we'd like to put on those habitats. And because we can control the ecosystem and the environment so carefully, um, we can do whatever we want with that ecosystem, including making it not habitable for humans, but habitable for creatures that used to exist, like dinosaurs, that, had, that existed in an atmosphere with a much higher oxygen saturation in the atmosphere. And so if we wanted to in future, we could create natural parks with dinosaurs in them, Dyson swarms of different orbital habitats arranged around the sun could host different habitats, some with dinosaurs in it, some with um, primates from a couple hundred thousand years ago that had a different kind of habitat, ocean habitats even that have a different atmospheric content. Um, I was just thinking because, you know, we, we always talk about making, uh, industrializing Earth or creating natural parks on Earth, but how cool when we could create entire habitats or entire plants dedicated to the preservation of individual species where you could allow evolution and nature to just run unchecked. And the book I read recently, Marshall T. Savage's The Millennial Project, Colonizing the Galaxy in Eight Easy Steps, talks at length about creating a whole lot of different habitats all around the solar system in future and being able to introduce different animals and that into those habitats and allow them to remain uh, completely free. And that is really cool and something that I've been thinking about recently. So if you're interested in that, get on it. The second thing I've been thinking about is building a 3D printer and airdropping food into the poorest communities of the world. Now, while it's not up to the rich and privileged in the world to decide what poor nations need, there's a lot of people out there in the world that are hungry and don't have access to clean water and to nutritious food. And with the advent of 3D printing and how that's really going to take off even more so in the next couple of years, and genetic uh, modification of foods and growing of foods like in vitro meat and that, is there a way for us to get food and water into communities that need it or don't have the means of producing it themselves because there's a drought or because they don't have uh, the right farming techniques or there's too many people in the city to be sustained by the little infrastructure and agricultural production they have there. Is there a way for us to take the increasing amounts of freely available energy in that in the first world and put it into devices and machines that can create food cheaply uh, and send that, not even send the food, but send the machine that creates the food into poor communities. I'm thinking of things like, you know, solar powered uh, desalination of water or 3D printing layers of cells to create, not beef patties, but you know, like nutritious, um, protein rich uh, layers of artificial meat or of, of real meat, even because in vitro meat is real meat, that can help people's protein deficiencies in third world countries. I mean, I live in South Africa, I know how bad the hunger problem is. You can see it when you just drive your car on the street. Um, and so I was just thinking about how to use these new technologies like 3D printers and 
um, in vitro meat or even even you know just like basic um, nutri nutritional information we have now about what the human body needs and how we can use machines and electricity and the the, the kind of um, entrepreneurial spirit that we have in Silicon Valley and you know through tech companies to a address some problems like food production and that and you know you might argue we've already got enough food it's just a matter of not wasting it and distributing it properly but I actually wonder if the distributing the food problem is not more difficult and more and worse for the climate because you have to use fossil fuels to transport food from uh, I don't know first world places to third world places is it not just better to produce the food from the natural resources the water the basic minerals whatever in third world countries and then have the food available there for the people that need it for the communities that are most struggling after natural disasters or droughts or political politically um, motivated famines and so that's something i've been thinking about actually using um tech and resources and that to produce food and water in the poorest communities of the world that really need it continuing on with the topic of electricity and that we obviously uh, use most of our electricity in the world comes from fossil fuels right now and in future we need to change that whether it's to nuclear fission or fusion uh, take your pick but um, I've been thinking a lot of recently about uh, generating electricity from the ocean and from waves sort of like a really advanced water wheel or tendrils that get the kinetic energy from waves and convert it to electricity. Also from Marshall T. Savage's book, uh, he talked about OTEX. I think it's Ocean Thermal Exchange System. It is Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion, uh, which is a process of technology for producing energy by uh, using the temperature differentials between the hot water on the top of an ocean and the cold water uh, a couple hundred meters down in the ocean. And using those temp temperature differentials and some heat exchangers to heat a gas that can turn a turbine and can generate electricity. And then the cold water cools down that gas again into a liquid and the cycle it can be freely renewed by the energy in the ocean. And it can generate net electricity as a really renewable energy resource. Uh, it's just not that efficient at the moment and since so I've been thinking about maybe you know, getting into that or I see they've built a, a test plant in Hawaii uh, of an OTEC um, power plant it's not that efficient and it doesn't generate that much electricity but maybe thinking about going into entrepreneurship or just uh, improving the process or making it work uh, more efficiently because in some communities in that where there's abundant um, ocean space and abundant um, wave power how can we generate more electricity more cleanly to communities that need it or because humans are an ever-growing species in that and you can argue whatever you want about degrowth and the need for humans to stop infecting the planet which i disagree with and i'm going to make a whole nother video about but we need electricity especially if we're going to do things like create food and water and that using electricity we need clean abundant sources of electricity and so using the ocean which is one of our biggest uh, untapped resources uh, in a non-destructive manner, like generating electricity from temperature differentials. I think that's a big opportunity and I've been thinking about it recently and how we could go about using the ocean, in particular just because it covers two thirds of the planet and it's such a big resource for good and for human use without even disturbing the ecosystem because like OTEC, ocean thermal energy conversion uh, doesn't damage the ocean or its um, environment in any way. So I've been thinking about that a lot recently as well. Um, and, and then on the, the topic of talking about um, saving the planet and keeping the environment nice and that, we come to my fourth idea, which is to prevent global warming by covering the entire northern Canada, northern Canadian land mass with reflective sheets to mimic ice caps. A lot of the reasons why global warming is bad as well because it melts the ice caps. And those ice caps are what usually reflect a lot of sun, sunlight that's hitting the earth back into outer space. And when the ice caps melt, and then more sun hits the earth and warms the earth more and melts even more ice caps and it's like a negative feedback loop. But if we can create more reflective surfaces on the ground, we can perhaps uh, bounce more of that light back into space and stop global warming uh, from progressing at such a hectic pace like it has been for the last couple of decades. And so obviously, you know, covering an entire land mass is a difficult proposition, but humans over very few short years can spread over vast uh, areas of land, you know, building cities, demolishing farmland and that. And if we really put our minds to it, we could probably also install a lot of reflective material. It doesn't even have to be that thick, you know. If you think about how thin mirrors are or how thin, you know, some plastic sheeting can be, if you have a big enough area of land mass, um, covered by like a reflective material like a white top or uh, you know something similar even just planting a certain type of tree that reflects more light into space or absorbs more or light or something like that um, could be a way to mimic the ice caps and help the ice caps regrow and uh, you know save the planet by just bioengineering the environment around us. I also had an idea about bio genetically engineering a tree to be more aggressively carbon sucking although I think trees do that already pretty good 
um, pretty well and we, we can't really plant enough trees to offset the amount of carbon we put into the atmosphere because we just put in so much carbon atmosphere you'd have to cover the entire planet with trees which is kind of infeasible uh, and so yeah also just thinking about carbon sequestration technology recently and you know maybe we should just cover a whole lot of uh, land mass with reflective material to reflect some sunlight into space these ideas may sound silly and that and you know we should people will argue oh you know we should just stop polluting the environment but I'm gonna make a video about it sometime but no one wants to give up the lifestyle that we have now and the lifestyle that enables me to make this video on my camera and you to watch it on your computer or phone and the internet and all the enabling infrastructure we all want that and we just have to find a way to get the things that humans want without destroying of the environment uh, more efficiently um, so I'm gonna make a whole video about that but so there's a lot of the ideas I've been thinking about recently my third idea is that um, with the coming of space travel on that in the next couple of years with Musk and SpaceX and that doing such a good job we're going to be going to space in the next couple of decades and that's probably going to be the biggest invention of the century maybe in my opinion one of the biggest inventions is like really commercializing space travel and making it affordable and opening up the entire industry that is the solar system because there is vast untapped potential resources there that we can use for our aims and for the planet's aims the environment's aims but um you know human beings we are have fragile bodies that aren't really conducive to space travel or the radiation and harsh environment of space but those harsh conditions and the radiation problem become less of a problem if we engineer ourselves and not the environment. Just what I was talking about now about leaving the environment alone and changing ourselves and changing our technologies. With genetic engineering and CRISPR in, that, in the next few years, I am wondering if it might not become feasible to start engineering humans to have a higher radiation tolerance or better cancer um, you know, defeating mechanism or ca cancer detection mechanisms or cancer um, destroying, or, you know, cancer destroying technology like nanobots and that. I know it's starting to sound really sci-fi here, but the medicine that we have today in terms of like immunotherapy drugs for cancer and antibiotics and that was science fiction a couple of decades ago. And so, you know, in a couple of years time, if human beings can take mastery of our own bodies more or can survive with less oxygen because our cells use oxygen more efficiently or we have mechanisms inside our body that can use the resources around us more efficiently maybe we won't have to change more of the space environments or of indeed the earth's environment to suit our needs like if humans um humans organs perform better with less oxygen in the next couple of years or can defeat cancers more easily we don't have to worry about radiation shielding as much in space we don't have to worry about um creating warmth uh, through fossil fuel um through fossil fuel uh, use like to create to uh, heat our houses and our homes and that if your skin and your body can better regulate its temperature against the outside world these are all things that we could probably do and we could probably um, improve our body's performance in certain areas like radiation tolerance and temperature tolerance uh, and just you know the idea I've been thinking about the idea recently of engineering ourselves and not engineering the environment uh, for a change um, might be a better way of progressing forward as a species and using our technology and changing ourselves rather than changing the environment. Um, you know, whatever your thoughts are on about saving the planet and saving the environment, whether you're a naturalist where you believe humans are an infection on the earth and we should all be scoured and we should all die, which I do not agree with and you're full of shit if you think that. Anyway, I'm going to make another video about it. Um, but you know, perhaps engineering ourselves instead of engineering the, engineering the environment might let humans expand at the rate we've been expanding and are probably going to expand in the next couple of centuries um, without having such a detrimental effect on our environment and our surroundings. And so those are all some of the things that I've been thinking about recently. Indeed, the next couple of years and decades of technology are going to be amazing to witness and I really hope to be around for a lot of it. And I'm not trying to be a prophet by making this video here, but just trying to put some ideas out into the world so that if you may be thinking about certain things, you might do some more research or get more involved in certain things or, you know, the more people are thinking about our hard problems that we have to solve in the world or creating new technologies or creating new things for humans to enjoy or for the environment to thrive upon, um, the better. And so I hope that I've inspired you with some very interesting, wild ideas today. So thank you for watching and I'll see you really soon. Bye.